You wanted it. You asked for it. It's here. Hello, Minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Reese and I were talking about what episodes I haven't done that I've been meaning to do, that I've been promising to do, that you've asked me to do, and glazing. Glazing is one of those. This may actually work into several episodes. I'm starting today with the basics. Just basically, what is it, what you need to know, and the fundamental mechanics of doing glazing. I'm going to cover some tips. We're going to cover the reasons that you glaze. And I'm just going to show you a few examples. Now, in reality, I've actually done several videos where I've painted and glazing has been involved. So you may want to go back and view those. I will list them down in the description. I will have links to them. With the information that's in this video, you'll be able to go back and watch those and look out for some of the things that I talked about. Because sometimes when you're painting on video, it's not really evident what you're doing and that it's actually a glazing process. So I'll have a list of those videos below and you can check them out after watching this video. Glazing is just such a powerful, powerful technique and it offers a lot of control. It's not for the impatient though. So what do you say? We just want to get right into it today. All right, so we're going to review some of the basics of glazing. Glazing is actually an oil painting term, so it's kind of a misnomer when it's applied to watercolor. Glazing has always kind of been uh, referred to in, in oil paint as very thin layers, usually an oil layer with a little bit of pigment in it, or a rosin layer like liquid with just a little dissolved pigment and it's built up layer by layer and that's essentially what you do with watercolor too but they don't build on top of each other quite in the same way but the effect is about the same essentially glazing is just layering that's all it is now we're going to go into the reasons people glaze and how it's done and it's really pretty simple it's just a few things that you need to keep in mind and i'll cover those tips as well I think one of the chief reasons I glaze is control of values. You can gradually deepen values. You can adjust easily. So let's start doing some um, examples. So control of values can take several forms. Basically you can be doing gradual shading. You can be adjusting. In other words, you didn't get it dark enough. So you want to make it darker. A glaze is perfect for that and the same as is almost identical to it is just gradual deepening it would help if I could spell one way of shading that you're probably familiar with is wet and wet while it's wet you charge in a darker color or another color and it blends while it's wet but glazing is also a really effective way of doing that and you have a lot more control. It takes longer, you have to wait for layers to dry, but basically I want to shade into this. So I'm adding a little purple to the mix, blotting out my brush, and just blending out that edge. Now, if you haven't seen my video on blending, I'll put a link to it, and it'll show up right up there. And it'll also be in the description. So shading, adjusting values that previously you might have liked but now want deeper. Let's see, look at this cube, for instance. So we want to go on this side and glaze in um, a shadow or a deeper value to show that this side of the cube is in shadow. Now keep in mind the glazing is always done wet over dry. Okay, so we have a lot of control with values using the glazing technique. We can shade, we can adjust values from what we had to something darker. Also keep in mind that you're always going to go darker because it's a light to dark medium. You're always adding value so it will always get darker and darker and darker very important to keep in mind it's not like oil acrylic where you can paint lighter values on top another great use for glazing 
is subtle color changes. Now this can be adjustment. You may be adjusting a color or you may just want to get nice variegation and subtle color changes. Now just like with controlling values you can do that wet and wet where you charge a color and another and they blend but you don't have the finite control that you have with glazing. Let's say we want to get a nice a uh, nice little kind of arc of a different color going over here on one side. Maybe more of a red. So we get our brush just as wet as we need to, but not too wet, to pop in a nice little red wash. It's usually better than all at once. In other words, if you're not sure how much pigment you want to put into that color subtle change, less is better than more. So I've got a nice little subtle color change here from orange to a red orange. And I can just I can be as tedious about blending out that edge as I want. But should I want it darker, then I would wait for that to dry and I would do it again. That's the beauty and the control of glazing. Now just to go back to my previous point, these are both dry enough, I think. So let's say I want that shading to get darker. Let's put a third glaze over it. Again, I'm only going as light, as wet as I have to, to spread the wash evenly. I'm drying out my brush and blending out that edge. Now we have deepening from three glazes. Let's look at this adjustment demo. So I want to adjust that. I think that's really dark. I can't really lighten that effectively, so I'm going to darken the other facets kind of make it work. So we're going to give some color. I had that as a white hot highlight. We're going to give some color to the lightest part. And in fact, I'm going to carry that on down to this side. It doesn't matter if they bleed here, since it's still one wash. And in the process, that darkens that side. So now I've adjusted values by using three separate glazes. And you can keep up with you know doing that. After that dries, I can go back and darken that again if I want. Another reason, which is similar to our subtle color change for glazing, is mixing. So rather than you know subdividing this into little areas and then painting some of it orange and some of it, let's go with like a kind of a wine red. I'm going to go with a deeper a uh, rose. This is a quinacridone rose, but the orange will bring it back to red. And so now I can I can glaze. Oh, I'm just kind of making this up. I can glaze in the areas that I want the new color. Now I've painted in a quinacridone rose, but I'm accounting for the fact that visually that rosy color is going to mix with that orange, and it's going to come out a little bit redder. Okay, sometimes that's very useful. Uh, for instance, one way I would use that is if I'm painting a leaf. A leaf. Uh, this color is a little dirty, but I may start out with something very pale and yellow. Let that dry, and I'll illustrate my point. As a matter of fact, let me make that just a little bit more yellow while it's wet. Better get across the point. Okay, so that's dry, and I added a couple more swatches down here because I want to show you a good exercise if you're new to glazing. But anyway, back to visual mixing using glazing. So you can start out with a yellow leaf uh, where you want parts of the leaf to be yellower, and you can come in and glaze in kind of a blue-green. In this case, I'm using a Prussian blue. And you can see where the Prussian blue is visually mixing with the yellow color that I put down and creating a green. That's creating a subtle change of yellow to green. So visual mixing, very important. And you can combine techniques too. Uh, I uh, very often will do some charging when a glaze is still wet. So that glaze is still wet, so you know I want to charge in wet and wet a little bit of deeper Prussian blue down here, right? In fact, I do that quite often. So glazing doesn't always have to be 
perfectly dry on or wet on dry. Sometimes while your glaze is still wet, you can charge into it. Another uh, way of using visual color mixing is um, dulling or neutralizing. So let's say, okay, I got this uh, orange way too bright and this also fits under the category of adjustments but um, it's a form of mixing so what's the complement of orange it's blue so uh, I'm going to go in here with a very light light I'm going to start real light because I don't know how much uh, I'm going to to affect that wash and I'm going to use a some ultramarine blue and glaze over that orange I'm going just as dry as I can because some of these deeper colors, like the red I put in there, will easily loosen up. So you want to be careful of that. Now I have a much more neutral, less intense orangish color. And what I suggest is that um, whatever you're painting, uh, put down what you would consider your base colors. Um, and uh, this will give you a chance to experiment um, with your palette. So start with your base colors and start glazing swatches so you can get a visual idea of what the glaze is going to do to the color. This is just a good way to practice glazing anyway. Use different intensities if you want. That was the same red but a little more intense. Let's try an orange. Let's try a sap green and go out, you know, paint from the outside across because that way you can see what the color is and then you can see how it changes by going over the glazed swatch. Okay. And just familiarize yourself with what the glazing will do with the colors that you're currently using on your palette for painting. Now, another uh, really and this is really a feature more than a reason to glaze is luminosity. If you take the time to glaze in layers and be careful, you know, with your application of paint, you're just going to get a beautiful luminous glow to your paint, I think. And um, you just, you get all of the advantages of being able to shade gradually, adjust gradually. Um, do visual color mixing, do subtle color changes, and all while giving a, just a brilliant um, maximum light transmission. It's one of the beauties, I think, of glazing. It's one of the reasons I like it so much, is you can just get things to really glow. All right, so let me just leave you with my final tips. And some of this is a bit of a recap. These are my top tips for glazing and things to keep in mind. Try, if at all possible, to go from light to dark when glazing. In other words, your first layers are lighter, your later layers are darker. Now, you can glaze over dark colors, and in fact, I do it all the time. But it's more of an adjustment, and you got to be careful. You, you want those glazes to be very dry. I do it usually to add a different hue. So let's say I thought that this part of the leaf was too blue. So I might go in with a yellow or green and just lightly glaze. And I got to be careful not to get it too wet or I'll loosen up that darker paint. The darker the paint and the more pigment that's there, the more likely it is you're going to lift it and you'll end up with a mess. So just be careful if you do glaze, glaze over dark colors. To do it with a fairly dry brush and very very lightly use transparent pigments or semi-transparent um, and we've talked about this in other videos but generally all uh, artist quality watercolors rate all of their colors so whatever your chosen colors are it's M gram go online and look at their color chart and it will tell you which ones are their most transparent and stick with those if you're going to do a lot of glazing. Don't forget to protect your lights. 
And I have deplorable handwriting, so I hope you all can read this after I've written it. But wherever your lightest values are, make sure you protect those. This again is the beauty of glazing. You can go gradually. So paint lighter than you think you need it and glaze it down to the dark gradually. If you're unsure about what a color is going to do, test, test, test on swatches like this. Eventually you'll get the hang of it and you'll know, you know, what a glaze will do. But if you're unsure, it, it, it just helps to take the, the colors that are on your palette or that are in your painting and do uh, some quick little tests like that. Be careful of compliments because compliments will dull unless that's your goal like we did here. I was aiming to tone down that uh, orange in a visual mix. However, if you're painting something that's very intense, like a flower, be careful of glazing compliments because you're going to start dulling the color. Be careful of brushes that hold too much water. This is not the time to use a quill. They'll just end up with big, wet, washy messes, okay? Your glazes uh, are going to be harder to control if you use a quill. A quill, which is also called a mop, is for usually first application or single application washes with using a lot of water. A better glazing brush, especially if you're a beginner, would be a smaller, for the size that I was doing here, a smaller synthetic. Synthetics are a little easier to control uh, to get a drier glaze. So um, that's a really good tip. Remember, as I said before, that glazes are wet on dry. So make sure your underneath layers are dry. This can cause a lot of problems. If it's even slightly damp and you put water on there, you're going to end up with a back run. Or you may loosen the paint to a degree that you did not want. Now once you apply the glaze over the top, as we did up here, and that glaze is still wet, you can charge in a little more of the color, a deeper version of that color if you want to. But the underneath layer needs to be dry. Alright folks, that's it. Those are my glazing tips. Those are the basics. And really after this, it's just a matter of getting out your paints and painting and trying it. If you have any questions, put them down in the comments and I will attempt to answer your questions. It's a really fun technique and can produce some absolutely beautiful results. So I hope you'll experiment with it. Thank you everybody so much for watching. I appreciate it. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Thank you patrons for sponsoring me and making these videos possible. Couldn't be doing it without you. We'll see everybody in the next video.